Hello Googlers, thank you for taking time out of your um, lunch break today to hear about our story with Mellon Educate. Um, it all started for me in 2002, I went on a holiday to South Africa and when we left the main international airport heading for the city centre, I was shocked by the sight of tens of thousands of shacks abutting the side of a modern motorway. I was fascinated and um, disturbed by this site and my girlfriend and I had rented a house in Cape Town for a couple of weeks and after a couple of days I said to the guy who was looking after the house for us, would he mind bringing me to the nearest township? I wanted to see who were the people who were living in these terrible conditions. The first thing he said to me was, white people don't go into these townships and look it's better off you stay out it's too dangerous and if you want to do something donate a bit of money but really it's not a good idea to um to go in there and uh, being a stubborn irishman or entrepreneur uh, i pushed him a bit further and he gave in and 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 four minutes later i was in a township with a a lifestyle maybe three or four hundred years different to the one I was living in the house that we had rented and it was only four or five minutes away from where we were. I started out probably very similar to everybody here in the room with my own dreams and ambitions and one of the first things that really hit me was how I think all of us as we progress through our career when we overcome one obstacle or we achieve one achievement we take on a bigger target in front of us and all of the people that I met in, in this township, um, none of them had dreams that even went a fraction as far as mine had gone. And I met the local community and I walked around this township and the first thing that surprised me was how friendly everybody was to me. There wasn't the, the, uh, there wasn't the fear or intimidation that I had felt I would, I would get going into a township. Once I said a warm hello to people, I got a warm hello back. I asked that community, was there any way I could help? And they said to me, this was 15 years ago, that they had an, a number of um, school leavers who had qualified for college but didn't have the means financially to get to college. And, and, that, and that was the beginning of my connection with this township. I ended up sponsoring a number of students through college. And a short time afterwards, we were still on the same holiday, so it had to be in the first three weeks, I met the community leaders and I asked um, what was the situation with housing. This community of 12,000 people on 24 acres had built a total of six houses in the previous 12 years. So the sum total of effort of 12,000 people was one house every two years. And I asked to meet the community and the following day I was brought back and put on top of the, a number of wooden pallets and I found myself speaking to a few hundred local people and I said to them that if they were willing I was willing to work with, if they were willing for me to work with them then, then I was willing to try and see could we improve the housing situation. So we launched a housing program and I committed to building 450 houses over three years and uh, I was still on a holiday and soon afterwards I found myself in a rented car with a wheelbarrow in the booth of it and looking at how we were going to start this project. Um, I spent a couple of months planning it and shortly after um, we started building the houses um, maybe two weeks afterwards, the police arrived into the township looking for me and word had got around Cape Town. It was now on the radio that this guy on a holiday had started building houses in one of the townships and the police said to me, look, we understand what you're doing here. You're big hearted, well-meaning, but you're going to get killed here. You're not going to live more than two weeks. The gangs are going to kill you and look, you can't come in. Uh, with no experience as a foreigner and, and, and just help, you just won't last. So I went back to our rented house and 
weighed up that for a somber evening and uh, maybe it's the stubbornness of being an entrepreneur but I said to Nicola my partner that well look I've said I'm going to do it so I'm just going to do it regardless and hopefully things will, will work out okay. Um, after a short time building the houses it really dawned on me that this is an experience that everybody should have in your lifetime. Maybe not to make as big of a life change as I had made, but what if people could just decide to, to give six or seven days of your life helping poor people? Wouldn't that be amazing? Even if we went back to our own lives afterwards. So I announced a, a volunteer trip, and the first year I aimed to get 150 people and uh, maybe half of them I personally twisted their arms and I did a couple of radio interviews but 150 people signed up and the second year we were thinking what would we do and we said well, why don't we just try and double our target so we doubled it and then we doubled it and doubled it and doubled it and five or six years later our trips had gone from 150 to 300, 700, 1400 and by 2008 over 3000 people um, applied to come on our trip. I decided to host all of our trips on one week every year instead of doing maybe 20 little trips. In 2008, we had almost 2,000, over 2,000 people took off from the London airports here. We had to charter our own jumbo jets for the, we couldn't get enough seats on planes to bring them all, d all, all down to Cape Town. And on one day I stood at the airport, I wanted to shake hands with every person who was decent enough to come and help the mission that I had started that now became our mission. And over 19 hours I shook hands with over 2,000 uh, volunteers. Um, our charity within five years became the largest housing producer on the continent of Africa and all fueled through a spirit of collective volunteerism. Maeve mentioned um, Nelson Mandela and I was very privileged, I'm not sure the exact date, but within a year or two I got a phone call through somebody, you know, that Man Mr. Mandela would like to meet me and he was really fascinated how so many people from this part of the world would come and volunteer to help people they had never met and he really was full of such admiration and appreciation for the effort that all of our volunteers had made. So when we look at our housing program now, our official figure is 125,000, but we are probably closer to 200,000 people <coughs> are living in houses built out of the toil and sweat of people, same as I see here in front of me today. Three quarters of all of our volunteers have no specific building trade skill they just have big hearts and a desire to enrich their own lives and make a difference in the world um, in 2007 USAID or maybe it's 2006 I met the United States government and USAID applauded the efficiency of our housing charity they said to me they thought we were the world's <coughs> most efficient housing charity but they said they wouldn't be able to help us unless um, Congress voted to assist us that on a technical position on their structure they weren't allowed to give money for permanent dwellings even though they said they could spend $25,000 on a tent in Kosovo but a, a permanent structure was just a, a technicality and, um, and two years later one of the first pieces of legislation passed by the Obama admi administration was a law in Congress directing USAID to support the, the Mellon Township Initiative. Um, we, we've achieved great impact in South Africa and when we first started the national housing subsidy per house per family was a thousand <coughs> US dollars and the Mellon organization started to build a house for $10,000, a really good quality structure that would in time go up in value and be an asset to a poor family to, to, to build a better life um, from a quality house. Within seven or eight years, the South African budget had increased almost a thousand percent. And now throughout South Africa, it is effectively the Nile Mellon House that is built throughout the entire country that 
the house that is now in the in the South African National Housing Programme is effectively copy a copy of the Mellon House that we started to build. Um, three years ago, we looked at ourselves and we were at a crossroads and we said, well, do we, do we take a pat on the back and do we recognise we've done something special in housing and call it a day and go back to our, our, our ordinary lives? Or do we try and build on the magic of collective volunteerism and do something in another space where a lot of help is needed? And we decided we would get into education. It's probably singularly the biggest single space on the planet where people in poverty and developing <coughs> countries need help. And we decided as a strategy that we would spend a couple of years slowly learning about education to try and find the sweet spots, the special spaces that if we could get help from talented people that we really could make potentially a global impact with our education program. I set a personal mission to go and visit a hundred schools and to sit with the parents, the teachers, the school principals, the governing boards and ask thousands of questions and try and just spot the gap where maybe a, a help could, could, you know, large scale intervention would have twist on the existing program might, might, might lead to something very special. So we've started a couple of initi initiatives. Firstly, we need help from people to help us build good quality schools. If you're not in a classroom that's dry from the rain and, um, and safe and secure, children can't study to the best of their capacity. So the first thing we do in the Mellon organization is make sure we've built a structure that's fit for purpose. The second part we do afterwards is we try and train the teachers up to a standard to achieve a much better performance. So we looked around some of the uh, schools in townships throughout South Africa for exceptional school principals who had achieved results as good as any top school in, in, in the world anywhere. And one of the first people we recruited was a school principal who went into a secondary school of 1,500 pupils and a pass rate of 27%. In one year, he got it to 82%, and in two years, to 96%. We were really privileged that he joined our team, and talented people, as you people know, find other talented people. And from that small base, we recruited our, the, the beginning of our education team. We looked at South Africa, which deserves an awful lot of credit for what she has achieved. It's very easy to look at the things that South Africa is not doing maybe as well as she should. But, but overall, and I'm, I've learned a lot about South Africa in the last 15 years, I would be an enormous, um, an enormous fan of everything South Africa has achieved. She's 23 years old as a democracy. She's putting in more money into education than any other developing country in the world. She's putting in over 6.5% of her entire GDP um, into education, and that compares to European countries at approximately 4.5%. So she's putting in between a third to 50% more than European countries are putting into education, but she has inherited an enormous backlog of problems. Many South African teachers who specialize in English, maths and literacy under the old apartheid regime were never trained in the subjects that they're teaching. And we frequently meet teachers who for 25 or 30 years in a row have never achieved a pass rate in maths of over 5% in their subject. But South Africa is trying to embrace everybody and, and move forward and, and, and we've we have a new process beginning where we've asked South Africa to take some of the money she's spending on, on teachers, some of the money that they spend on the, the remaining parts of a school budget, and give that to an organisation like Mellon where we can run some schools ourselves, which hopefully will become real starship examples of what can be achieved with, with uh, a less, a less, maybe s less, inherited approach to, to school management. So we have now taken over a f the management of a few schools that me the Mellon organization are running. And in less than 12 months, the difference in the performance of our schools is staggering. 
We've achieved an improvement of almost 50% in our first 12 months in, in our first couple of schools, but we have much, much further to go and we won't be able to get there without help from people like you listening to me today who have the knowledge and the mindset to help us to scale up. One of the areas that we are really interested in doing is capitalizing on the human goodwill that we have experienced over the past 15 years. Everywhere we go throughout the world, people are full of love and goodwill. We've had over 22,000 volunteers, which is remarkable considering that 50% of them came from the UK and Ireland, and each of those people raised between four and 6,000 pounds to come with us. And together we changed the landscape of a country of 50 million people on housing. And we need your help today to do this on education. So the area that we are looking at now is how innovation and e-learning can accelerate our program. And what we see as a major gap that, now maybe you guys will find it where we haven't seen it, maybe somebody is doing it, but we haven't seen it so far. And, and that is connecting retired, our active school teachers in developed countries with um, a mentoring teacher to teacher, buddy to buddy, volunteering teaching program with teachers in developing countries. If I put this into context, in the United States, we have approximately three and a half million teachers. Here in the UK, we have approximately a half a million teachers. In the United States, 75,000 teachers retire every year and, and proportionately similar figures in the UK. If we get one hour a week from 2% of the teaching community in the United States or the United Kingdom, that will immediately impact in a transformational way 4 million children in South Africa. <coughs> so to improve the lives of 4 million children, we just need one hour a week through 2% of the teaching community in the United States and the UK. And how do we do this? We do it through technology and where the, the biggest deficit areas in education in South Africa are literacy, mathematics and language. 37% um, of, of children in South Africa who've been in school for six years cannot read. 37% cannot read after being in school for six years. Now, how little time would it take, not just, to, I'm talking today about teachers, but imagine if it was just people like yourselves and ourselves who are trained up in a little bit of literacy coaching. There are some so many skilled literacy programs where amateur people like ourselves can actually sit and read a book over the internet using technology to a, a child or a pupil at the other end, and that child's education is going to change dramatically. What I learned through volunteerism was the impact of um, large-scale collective volunteerism. In South Africa, initially, there was a curiosity about 150 volunteers coming, a bit more interest at 300 the following year, a lot more at 700, and then when 1,400 came on one go, uh, enormous impact, and then when over 2,000 came into a city of a couple of million people in Cape Town, and in the evening times, it's a first world country where the people you meet on the trip that during the day when you're working with them, you go out to restaurants in the evening, so all the taxi drivers are meeting our volunteers, and the city gets an enormous boost at the end of of such a week. We use our one week every year to leverage inspirational goodwill for the incumbent government in South Africa. So we invite ministers and leading politicians and, and for most of the time people are critical of, of politicians and maybe in some, in some cases deserve it but not in all cases that I see the sincerity and integrity of a lot of people working in the South African structure and maybe what our trip does is just send a message once a year that there are many of us around the world who care about the effort you are making to improve the lives of your people. On the last occasion that I was ever to meet Nelson Mandela, 
um, I had the cheek to go to him and tell him I wasn't coming to see him anymore and he paused for um, a few moments and I thought had I overstepped uh, my mark here that me telling him I wasn't going to come and see him anymore but I meant it in a nice way that he was an elderly man advancing years and I felt he should just be left for some special time in, in his remaining years with his family and I said to him that maybe not one of us could fill your footsteps but together there are many thousands of us who who can and 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 I said to Medivh that you can rely on me as one of your lieutenants to continue the journey that I've started inspired by people like you and other great South African leaders and when we parted Mandela reached across the table and held my hand and said that I should never forget that everything is possible through the power of the collective effort of people and the Google the Google business, the Google uh, uh, um, journey is extraordinary. You know, in the history of the world, has there ever been companies like Google that have been able to have had and achieved such a global impact on all of our lives? We are living in a very uncertain <coughs> and turbulent time in the world. You all know what's happening between the United States and North Korea and what's happening in Syria. And I think there have been very few moments in history when large-scale volunteerism has been as important as it is now to balance the great progress we've made in the world. What better message we can send to struggling nations than large-scale volunteering trips that serve to inspire and, and deliver greater progress in those countries. So we have two requests of you today that some of you might consider coming out on our volunteering trip. Debs is going to talk a bit more about that in a few moments. And um, it's one week out of your lives, but I can truly say to you, it's a week the memories of which will never ever leave you. It is so humbling and special to meet some of the poorest citizens on our planet and to hear their dreams and their ambitions and help improve the chances of those dreams becoming fulfilled. Um, we need help then on the technical side. We are a very small charity who's achieved great impact, but now we're a new charity starting in education. We need your help to promote Mellon Educate, to help us promote volunteerism and recruit more volunteers. What if, instead of 2,000 volunteers coming, what if over the next two or three years, we had a moment with 5,000 volunteers arriving in South Africa. What would be the ripple effect of such a positive trip like that? On the innovation and technology side, imagine how a large-scale internet-based volunteering program could affect the lives of millions and millions of children so easily. And one hour a week is all we need from people in developed countries and particularly teachers initially to, um, to benefit children. Um, so I'm, I'm going to leave you with one last, last story of my, my times with Mandela, um, which perhaps this story uh, will demonstrate what Mandela meant to the world and in a way what South Africa's success means, certainly for Africa, if not for the whole planet. That one time I was with Mr. Mandela and, an, and another friend, and uh, I was asked to meet this young guy, you know, and Mandela said, um, now you, you tell Niall your story. And this guy said to me, well, I, I was a young, um, young boy of, I can't remember exactly, I'll pitch to this, I'll be slightly wrong, but approximately 12 years of age when the war broke out in Rwanda. And, and I can't remember who was on the Hutu or Tutsi side, um, but the other side came into his house and in front of him they killed his parents and all of his five or six brothers and sisters. And this young boy went down to the elder in his village, terrified, and, and, and said, what do I do? They've said they're going to come back for me tomorrow. And the elder said, it was just when Mandela had been made president, and the elder said, if you can get to South Africa, you'll be safe. Mandela has just been made president and you have to get to South Africa. And that little boy gathered um, his underpants and I think two t-shirts 
and a little bag and he walked or probably got a train, train journey or hitched a bus along the way, but he, he made it over 3,000 miles simply on the, on the inspiration of what Mandela could do for him. And Mandela's legacy has been one of embracing everybody at the same time as trying to help his own country. South Africa has never been given enough credit for the fact that she has kept her borders open to refugees. Several million um, people have found a home in South Africa in the 23 years of the new democracy in South Africa. And, and it is vital to the continent of Africa that we help South Africa to achieve true success as quickly as possible and the ripple effect of that will reach an entire continent. So I hope I'll see some of you in, in South Africa and maybe some of you might have ideas together. Maybe we could potentially form a Mellon Educate Google team on the innovation side that might be able to help um, some dinosaurs like myself to find a better way to quickly get through that innovation <coughs> um, opportunity and create a platform that'll, uh, that will, will give an opportunity for teachers to help um, our children in South Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you.